Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to Brain and Behavior. I am Dr. Ark Verma from ID Kanpur. As you know, I work at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences and also the Interdisciplinary Program in Cognitive Sciences at the Institute. This is week 5 of the course and in this week we will talk about the neural basis and neural mechanisms behind memory. Now, one of the most fascinating aspects of being alive is the change one goes through almost every passing moment or at any span of time. What causes these changes in our experience? Uh, what causes these changes in our sense of knowledge, in our view of the world or even our view of ourselves? While a part of these changes definitely comes from our genetic makeup and the processes of growth and maturation of the brain and the body, a lot of these changes are rooted in our experiences that we have since we are born. Every day we come across uh, something new, something unique. Every day we come across maybe say for example even a repeated experience of the same thing uh, and new insights are uh, you know are gained from that new realities, new truths kind of dawn upon us and we pick up something from each of these things. That is basically what experiences uh, we are talking about. Now our experiences provide us with a pool of data which allow us to deduce information and retain it for future use. Say for example, uh, I have given this example earlier as well. Say for example, if there is a very young child and the mother brings a, a, a cup of milk and the child uh, you know impatiently just grabs onto the cup of milk but to just to realize that it is too hot and it is not uh, supposed to be touched immediately. That experience, if once it happens, at least even once for that matter, the child will learn that whenever the mother is going to bring that cup of milk, you have to be patient and only uh, touch it when asked to do so. So everything, uh, say for example, if you come to class, uh, uh, you know, uh, on a particular day, and uh, anything that you kind of learn that is new, uh, it gives you some more information and gives you some data uh, using which you can say sort of uh, you know deduce. Okay, uh, this is what happens when I do not uh, you know sleep well at night. Uh, it causes uh, you know certain degree of fatigue, it causes certain degree of uh, uh, problem with the cognitive processes. So, maybe I should make it a point to uh, you know uh, sleep adequately uh, at night, things like that. So, every all of these experiences that we go through, all of these experiences actually uh, in some way or the other provide us a pool of data uh, from which we can deduce information and then retain it for our future use. Okay? So, in other words, learning to pick out important and relevant pieces of information from experience and then remembering the same for the future is what causes these relatively permanent changes in behavior. Now, this relatively permanent change in behavior is basically something that we are going to be concerned with and in this chapter or in this week, let us say, we will talk about what are the neural mechanisms that uh, facilitate these relatively permanent changes in behavior and how are these changes, let us say, manifested in the brain. Now, for the sake of definition, we can define uh, learning as a relatively permanent change in behavior caused by experiences, whereas we can define memory as the outcome of the processes of learning that involves the retention of useful information either as a fact let us say that you know sunrises in the east, uh, the Prime Minister of India is Mr. Narendra Modi, uh, things like that. Okay, or as an episode, this is where I went for my vacations. I stayed at that particular hotel. We had this for breakfast, that for lunch, and we went out to see these uh, important memorable places. Or even say for example, skills. Say for example, I went to practice, or I went uh, uh, to the swimming school uh, to learn swimming after uh, going there for several days now i can swim and the best uh, you know stroke that i know is let us say the butterfly stroke or something like that okay so each of these experiences sort of if they are retained uh, the way they are retained the manner in which they are organized and retained in our cognitive system can be referred to as memory and as we said this could be either as a fact as an episode or say for example uh, uh, basically a scale all right. Now, there is a wide variety in the kinds of information that we retain, the period that we retain them for and the processes used to acquire, retain and later use them. In this chapter, we will talk about the neural basis of various aspects of memory as I have been saying. Now, uh, I am sure you would uh, know this from an earlier psychology class or let me just revise this for you. 
uh, theoretical models uh, of memory have distinguished basically three kinds of memory or three uh, stages in memory. First is sensory memory, which basically refers to very, very short lived sensory impressions. This lasts from a few milliseconds to, a f uh, to maximum a second. Uh, this basically refers to all the information that is impinging upon your senses. Say for example, you can talk about auditory information, visual information, information about particular kind of odors, tastes, touches, etc. All of this information that is impinging on your sensory apparatus, on your sensory modalities can be basically initial, the initial part of that information can be considered as being part of sensory memory. The other kind of memory is, you can call it short term memory, if you say for example, uh, going by the older model of Atkinson and Schifrin or you can call it working memory, basically going by more recent models given by Alan Badley and colleagues. Now, short term memory or working memory basically refers to medium lived memories that typically last from a few seconds to sometimes a minute and are amenable to use and manipulation. So, you can use this information, you can recall this information, maintain this and uh, be conscious of it or manipulate this information. Say for example, 2 plus 2 equals to 4 is basically something that is done in your working memory. You retrieve the concept of the number 2, you uh, retrieve the concept of addition, you add 2 to itself and then you come up with the answer that okay, 2 plus 2 is equals to 4. All right. Uh, finally, uh, long term memory basically refers to the memories that may last from just a very few seconds to sometimes entire lifetimes if they are so important. And these are typically what constitute our knowledge about this world, our courses of action and even our view of ourselves. So, for all practical purposes when we are talking about his memory is too sharp, his memory is bad, his memory is good. Uh, or say for example, I remember where uh, I went uh, to school in my childhood, I remember the teachers, I remember the friends, I remember the classroom, all of this typically comes under your long term memory. Now, researchers have divided the process of uh, learning and acquiring new memories into three major stages. Okay? So, the first stage is called encoding. What is encoding? Encoding is simply the process by which you are acquiring new information and forming new memory traces so that they can be stored. Every new interaction you have with the world sort of is a way to encode say for example, unknown uh, aspects or unknown facts about this world and you sort of uh, you know can retain them, you form memory traces and you can retain them. Encoding is basically uh, supposed to have two steps, first is acquisition, now, acquisition basically refers to the process of selecting the sensory impressions to form memory traces that can be sustained and transferred to short term memory. What is this uh, need of selecting sensory impressions? If you remember from the last chapter when we were talking about uh, attention, if you remember from the last chapter where we, where we were talking about attention, we were talking about the fact that uh, at any point in time, the amount of stimulation that is received at our sensory modalities is huge. We need to select some of that in order to be able to process this. Acquisition is very much like that. Which sensory experiences that you are having at any point in time need to be sustained, revised, rehearsed and sent to short term memory is basically one of the aspects that uh, acquisition controls. Once you have selected that, then comes consolidation. Consolidation basically refers to the changes in the brain that lead to stabilization of this new information and its retention for a longer period of time. Now, how do you store, how do you select, how do you stabilize any uh, source of information? You basically need uh, the activity in the brain to sort of register this new experience uh, and not only just register this, uh, to stabilize it by uh, having some changes in the uh, you know in the brain corresponding to some changes in the environment okay so that is the idea behind consolidation so basically the period for from uh, for consolidation can last from days to months to even years where over a period uh, a particular memory could become stronger and stronger due to several iterative recollections or say for example, several uh, repetitive experiences. Suppose say for example, you are going to learn a particular skill, I was talking about swimming. The first time you put your feet in the water, the first time you sort of lie horizontal and try to flap your arms and legs, uh, that is the first experience. There is something corresponding to that experience that will be changing in the brain. If, you, if that is just a one-off thing, 
uh, it is one way but suppose you go there every day and you try the same kind of skills every day there are bound to be some changes in the brain that will register that experience analyze that experience for you and will basically stabilize and consolidate the experiences from that particular activity eventually that will basically form the basis of learning the skill of swimming all right so encoding basically uh, comes in uh, two steps acquisition selecting what you need to pick up from the environment and consolidation basically having corresponding changes in the brain basically which will establish those uh, experiences once you've learned something once you've acquired something encoded something let us say uh, the other uh, step is storage storage basically uh, refers to the uh, it's basically a result of acquisition and consolidation and leads to more stably more stable and relatively permanent record of the learned information now uh, the uh, after you've encoded and you've stored you the other thing is just to use this information which is now uh, very well placed in or indexed in your brain okay now retrieval basically refers to this process of being able to access and use the stored information to create new behavior so that is basically what is retrieval so uh, i hope this is clear uh, we are talking about encoding storage and retrieval uh, which are the basic um, processing mechanisms in uh, order to acquire memory now let's look at uh, the anatomy of the memory let's look at uh, very grossly the neural structures that support memory now it seems that the brain does have the capability to change with all the experiences and uh, that one goes through in our lifetimes everything that you do is uh, in some way or the other registered in the brain all right so it basically means that changes occur in the brain at the level of synaptic connections between neurons so there are assemblies of neurons if you remember we have talked about uh, donald hebb and his idea of uh, you know uh, uh, neurons that fired uh, fire together wired together that kind of concept so the idea is that uh, uh, assemblies of neurons uh, networks of neurons will basically uh, you know through synaptic connections fire in a manner so as to register the changes that are going on in the environment uh, so as to register the new experiences that you are having okay uh, so um, that is basically what is the physical registry or the physical recording of your experiences in the brain now uh, given that we are talking about not single neurons at uh, isolated uh, regions of the brain we are talking about networks which sort of means that learning can happen or must be happening at different regions across the brain which basically would also translate into the fact that different areas of the brain would eventually the different areas of the brain would eventually get specialized for different types of learned information so that is something that uh, basically leads to physical registry of information and experiences in the brain now among the areas of the brain that are supposed to constitute the medial temporal lobe memory system uh, there are these very very important areas the hippocampus uh, and the surrounding structures the surrounding structures are namely the entorhinal cortex the perirhinal cortex the parahippocampal cortex within the temporal lobe and the subcortical structures including the ma mammillary bodies and the anterior thalamic nuclei so uh, the hippocampus basically is a very very important region uh, we will see and we'll talk about this in much more detail going further but the hippocampus has connections with several regions of the cortex via the entorhinal cortex and also the output projection pathway of the fimbria and the fornix to the subcortical portions of the system that are connected to the frontal cortex now another important structure that involved Uh, or is deemed to be involved in memory is the amygdala uh, which is situated in the temporal lobe um, and is mainly involved with affective processing but amygdala has also been deemed as very important for uh, process of learning and memory and we'll see how is this actually implicated in the future lectures now this is basically a, a diagram a representation borrowed from gesanica you can see that these are the areas so th these are the mammillary bodies the anterior thalamic nuclei the fornix uh, this is the medial prefrontal cortex if we're talking about this is the medial temporal lobe this area uh, you can see the hippocampus you can see the perirhinal cortex entorhinal cortex this is basically the medial temporal lobe memory system which we'll be talking about again and again and which is basically the system of uh, uh, neural uh, structures that are deemed to be superiorly important that are deemed to be very very important in the acquisition of memories now let us move further let's talk a little bit about 
uh, deficits of memory that are possible. Let us talk about amnesias. Now, deficits of memory can result from various causes. Uh, say, for example, they can result from damage to the brain caused by surgery, disease, uh, physical or psychological trauma. And these deficits of memory from various causes uh, lumped together can be called as amnesias. Now, amnesias basically refer to a form of a memory impairment that would affect all of your senses. It, it is not something that will just affect one, uh, uh, one aspect of memory. Now, usually what happens is that patients who are suffering from amnesia would display deficits in specific types of memory or in specific aspects of processing that lead to memory and then each of these specific deficits may be linked to the specific lesions that these people have in their brain. Let us take an example, uh, the left hemisphere damage can selectively uh, impair verbal memory, memory about verbal materials, words etcetera, whereas right hemisphere damage can uh, and would result in say for example, deficits in memory for non-verbal items, say for example, images and uh, colors and those kind of things. Okay. Now, this is again we have talked at a very gross level, we will kind of uh, you know zoom in a little bit further when we go ahead. Now, uh, a very important uh, type of amnesia is anterograde amnesia. Now, anterograde amnesia is basically used to refer to the inability uh, to form new memories after injury or damage to the brain. Suppose somebody has suffered a stroke which has damaged a particular area of the brain, we will talk about that specific area moving further, but it has damaged a particular area in the brain that is let us say responsible for formation of new memories. What could happen then is because that area that was responsible for formation of new memories, the person will not be able to form any new memories, remember anything post that injury, stroke, accident, surgery whatsoever. The other kind of amnesia that people uh, sometimes uh, suffer with is called retrograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia is basically what refers to the loss of memory for events and knowledge that is acquired prior to the uh, lesion or injury to the brain. Retrograde amnesia is sometimes temporarily limited. So, sometimes you can say for example, forget everything be, uh, behind uh, the point there where uh, you know, behind the point where the injury was uh, supposed to happen or sometimes it could be temporarily limited. Say for example, you will just forget uh, stuff extending back to only a few minutes or a few hours. Say for example, sometimes people suffer with accidents and sometimes even though the injury is not so much, the shock is such that the person does not remember the entire 48 hour, 24 hour uh, prior to that accident. Sometimes it could extend to months, sometimes it could extend to even a couple of years or maybe a few more years. Okay. So, mostly uh, one of the things that is important uh, to note for uh, retrograde amnesia is that mostly uh, retrograde amnesia is most severe for events that are uh, most recent prior to the injury or accident and this phenomena is referred to as the temporal gradient or the Ribot's law. Okay. So, this is something that you have to sort of remember. Now, sometimes amnesias can be brought upon by uh, you know surgical removal of the brain areas. Now, this is something that uh, is, uh, has happened uh, many a times in the past and uh, basically one of the one of the most important um, uh, individuals or one of the most important cases uh, that uh, were of the same kind was one of uh, this gentleman uh, called Henry Molaison and what was what happened was let us talk a little bit about his story. Now, Henry Molaison uh, suffered from extreme epilepsy since his childhood and this epilepsy left him debilitated, unable to work at, unable to lead a normal life by around 20, 25 years of age. Now, to relieve him of the extremely frequent epileptic seizure that he was having, Dr. William Scoville, uh, Dr. William Scoville of the Hartford Hospital in Connecticut offered him uh, a treatment which was experimental surgical therapy. Now, this treatment basically involves uh, you know surgical removal of the uh, supposed uh, you know sources of these epileptic seizures. Now, for H M uh, because he was so desperate that okay I need to just you know get rid of so many of these seizures that are happening to me, he agreed to undergo this particular procedure. So, let us see what happens. As part of the procedure, surgery was performed on HM's brain and both of his temporal lobes including the amygdala, entorhinal cortex and the hippocampi on from both the hemispheres were removed. Now, what this surgery does is that it treats his epilepsy, he does not really suffer from any epileptic seizures post the surgery, but the side effects of the surgery and removal of those specific organs of the brain was that HM developed a severe case of amnesia of 
anterograde amnesia. So, although he could re he could remember his personal history, uh, he could remember parts of his school knowledge, uh, language, basic skills, uh, people he knew and so on, but it was only up till the most recent two years of his surgery. All right. And most strikingly though, HM had entirely lost the ability to form any new long term memories. So, what could happen was, uh, once he has been having an experience for a few seconds, for a few minutes, he would probably retain something for a few seconds, uh, maybe a minute or so, but he would not be able to retain it beyond a uh, few minutes. So, he could not retain any new information for more than a few seconds or at best minutes, even say for example, not being able to recognize a nurse that had just left the room after seeing him or a doctor that has been treating him uh, for so long. All right. So, this is basically something that is very, very uh, interesting and uh, uh, you know uh, it handed uh, while the surgery uh, you know relieved HM of his surgery, it handed him uh, a life that was uh, in a sense uh, never had that sense of you know continuity after a particular point in time. Now, to get a better picture of the post surgical deficits in the memory of HM, uh, Dr. Scoville joined hands with Brenda Milner who was a psychologist and conducted several thorough neuropsychological examinations on HM. Now, what is neuropsychological examinations? They are just tests or batteries of tests that basically test you for specific cognitive uh, abilities and specific cognitive deficits for that matter. Now, uh, in the remainder of his life until his death at the age of 82 years, HM had become the subject of study for over 100 researchers and count and the, uh, and the subject for countless journal articles and popular uh, stories. During these tests, uh, which uh, Scoville and Milner were giving him, uh, several insightful facts came to light about the nature of memory, etc. For example, the extent of memory loss in a patient actually depended upon the extent of the temporal lobe that was removed. So, it sort of established that the temporal lobe is the structure that is very, very important for acquiring and retention of memories. More significantly, uh, only those patients would experience severe amnesia for whom a bilateral resection of the hippocampus was done or uh, bilaterally both the hippocampi were removed. Other patients for whom only one part of the hippocampus was removed uh, basically suffered only mild memory loss. All right. Now, let us come back to HM. HM uh, was uh, one of the first uh, pure cases of severe amnesia as he was completely normal with respect to other cognitive abilities. For instance, he had normal intelligence, normal perceptions, albeit a little bit of uh, problems with the olfactory perception, which by the way as you would know uh, from the last chapter that is uh, located around the medial temporal lobes. Now, while HM could not remember anything for the most recent two years prior to uh, his surgery, he showed selective memory loss for even sometimes as far back as decades. Although he showed normal digit span ability, so short term memory is sort of alright, he could not retain the digits if he was asked to retain them for longer periods of time. Now, HM therefore had been a severe case of anterograde amnesia. He had a severe case of anterograde amnesia as he is not able to form any new long term memories. Fascinatingly, however, while he could not consciously remember anything that happened recently, his behavior was sometimes shown to be affected by them. For example, he could learn tasks that involved motor skills or procedural skills. Say, for example, he could uh, pick up things that he were made to practice every day for a period of time, things like drawing you know, a star by looking at the mirror or some or tasks like that. Now, while HM's case was uh, was fairly insightful about the nature of memory etcetera and we will come back and we will keep coming back to HM uh, while talking about memories. More recent studies of memory loss have also been fairly important. For instance, it has become clear that the medial temporal lobes are necessary for the formation of long term memories and for the transfer of information about events and facts from short term memory into long term memory. Several new studies have also indicated that the medial temporal lobes are not implicated in the formation and retrieval of short term memories, memories uh, that stay for just a few minutes or even for acquiring long term memories that involve learning of procedural or motor skills. Okay. Finally, a, most, a lot of these more recent studies have established that the medial temporal lobe system may not be critical for things like general intelligence, aspects of cognitive control, perceptual abilities, language or motor functions. Because uh, all of these uh, functions are uh, retained and are unaffected in individuals like HM who had undergone uh, medial temporal lobe lesions. 
So I think this is all uh, I wanted to open this chapter with. This is a, just a bit of an introduction into what we will be talking about in the rest of the week. Thank you.